Good evening, everyone. Welcome back to the Evermore YouTube channel and podcast. It's Monday night. Me and Mark are back, regardless of the fact this is a bank holiday weekend, asking the same question we ask every Monday, and that is what's going on. I'll tell you what's going on. It has been a crazy Easter weekend. You know, we've had chocolate eggs, we've had crazy football games, we've had battered cod, and even had battered Mackhams, even to you, you sad Mackham <laughs> bastards. 5 1 to the mighty Blackburn Rose today. I had to get that one in. Early doors, but what's going on with you, Mark? How has your Easter weekend been, mate? Yeah, it's been good. It's five. It's five past Sunderland um, tonight, and it, we're ready for what's going on. <laughs> That's a great time. That's one of my favourite times. That uh, yeah. So not only is Halloween dominated when we batter them five one. Now Easter Monday is also five one day for the Mackhams. They've got the worst calendar in the world. They really have. God bless them. God bless them. But they are a massive club, as they keep telling us, don't they? So we'll uh, we'll not dwell too much. On them because we're talking about the other massive club in the northeast. No, not Middlesbrough Sunday. We're talking about Newcastle yeah. United tonight. That's what we're doing. But yeah, we've got loads to get stuck into. Matt, try to unpack that crazy game uh, from the weekend. Now my head's a little bit more clearer about it after the post match review that I did, where I even forgot goals and, and all sorts of stuff going on. But uh, I've had some time to think about it and calm my mind a little bit. So I'm sure. I'll be able to cover it in a little bit more detail. But just before we get moving, as we always say, if you haven't already, please subscribe. I'd love you to come and join us. We're nearly at 7,000 subs, guys. We're within 70 now. Uh, so smash that button if you haven't already. Recommend us to family and friends. Help us get to that 7K mark. We've got a great prize to give away when we hit 7K. So keep keep letting us tick up, guys. It's brilliant. Uh, love the support you guys give us. But just need a little bit more to get that next milestone. It's all free We're content. We want more. There we go. Of course we want oh, more. Exactly. Exactly. more. Exactly. exactly. Of course we are. Like Oliver Twist. Um, but yeah, so it's all free content on Evermore. But if you do want to give it back, there is a membership option down there too. Smash whichever option suits you best. We're live tonight. Jump in the comments as you always do. There's so much to get stuck into. We've got loads of you jumping in the comments already. But let's get stuck straight in then, Mark. <laughs> there's no there's no other place to start really than the absolutely batshit crazy game on Saturday lunchtime at St. James's Park, where Newcastle made a better comeback than Jesus Christ himself at Easter uh, from being 3-1 down against West Ham with, with massive help from uh, Harvey Barnes and Calvin Phillips, it must be said. But we're going to get stuck right into the, the, the good, the bad and the ugly about this game. But, but let's start with the good, Mark. What a comeback that was from the lads, mate, eh? Uh, yeah, I mean, I really didn't see it coming. I mean, it wasn't... West Ham took their chances and there were some, I know we're going to come to goalkeeping in a second, but there was some pretty poor goalkeeping from my point of view um, to, to allow them to get to that that point as well, as well as defending for, for that matter. But I didn't see it coming. And I think the certainly the way that the game planned out, the, the changes, the injuries, it, it's weird in, in a sense that the season has been so hampered by injuries for Newcastle and and it I think it took an injury to to really change the game um on Saturday when you have gone obviously gone back and, and watched it because I wasn't able to watch it live I, I went back and watched the whole thing again um and, and really the that that moment that, that Miggy goes down uh, and Barnes comes on from it is is the the game changer at that point because I, I just his influence at the top end of the pitch is phenomenal. He's, he's so clinical and he's just, I mean, we've talked about it so many times where you've missed that at the, at the top end and his ability to come in, his ability to play across sort of all really sides, but he, he likes to, to come in from that that left-hand side and be able to, to score goals. And we've seen it over the, the, the past few years at Leicester and, and he's showing exactly what, what you want, want him to, to do, but what a comeback, what a, what a way to do it with, with 15 minutes um if that to, to to kind of turn it around it was uh it was it was a sensational turnaround it was uh, don't worry i'm coming on to my ode to harvey barnes very soon because uh, my word that was an incredible impact it really was but but yeah it was a crazy game in in so many ways i mean the, the result is obviously what's in our minds and everything else. But now we've had a bit of time to calm down about things. I mean, there was parts of that game that, that weren't great as well. We, we are going to go through that. It would only be fair and right for us to do that. We're, we're not the kind of channel that just glosses over everything just because the result happened to be a really, really positive one. But but like I say, you have to give it to the lads to be 3-1 down at home against a decent side, it must be said, you know, who's you know, 
one silverware more recently than we have. You know, the, they've been at the right end of the table over the last few seasons, more on the wrong end of the table. And and the fact that they went 3 1 up and, and, you know, Kudus played really well. I think Bowen was quiet, and then he started to come back in a game, a clinical finish to put put them 3 1 up. And you were thinking, oh my God, you're like, this, this is going to be double tough. As you said, Mark, I couldn't see us getting back into it. And then, you know, more on this lad in a minute. But David Moyes decided to, he was either complacent or just completely stupid. But he decided to take Mikel Antonio off, who was bullying us really, and from a you know a centre forward position. Antonio isn't the player he once was. I think I said this in the preview, but he's still a handful, and he can cause you bother. And I think because Antonio was was up against the our back four, which which obviously changed thanks to the injury, which which threw everything into a spin. Uh, it allowed Paquetta to get so much space and time on the ball. But when he took Antonio off, that completely changed. And Paquetta didn't get on the ball enough. And because he, I don't know what he was doing, but him and Bruno kind of separated because they were in each other's pocket for quite a lot of the first half. And then when Antonio went off, then Paquetta seemed to disappear out of the game. And, and, and then Bruno got on the ball more, Mark, and started to make things happen. And then because, you know, the runners were there, you know, certainly Gordon, um, Isaac Barnes will, will come on in a minute. But I think when Newcastle, I mean, this season, because of the injuries, my God, we've talked about injuries to a blue in the face, but... We've never really, <laughs> we'll talk about it again in a minute, we've never really had a chance to play those three up front really in that front three position. And God, if those last 20 minutes were anything to go by, those three are frightening, aren't they? If they're, if they're bang at it, you know, like that and fit, mate. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think it, the Antonio sub was a game, again, a game changer. That's twice I've used that. But you're right. It, it took Paquetta away from being able to do what Paquetta does, which is get involved on the ball in the middle of the park. He was asked to play more, more almost as the striker at that point. And, and it removes him from, from really the dangerous areas. He's not a centre forward. Um, he's asked to, to fill in a role at that point. I, I guess the, from Moy's point of view, if you if you're going to take off a centre forward, surely Danny Ings would have been the answer at that point, rather than than, than taking off Antonio and putting you know was it um, Ben Johnson? I think he, he put on and he I, he looked lively when he came on. But he, again, you you you've taken away your focal point, and I think that really helped Newcastle. And especially, he must have been watching, and you could see Fabian Share holding his hamstring. You could see. Other players that had picked up little knocks, um, Gordon being one of them as well, that, that looked a little bit like he was carrying a, a slight knock as well. So surely you, you, you're you going at that point, you either play Bowen through the middle um, and, and you go at that point, but you remove your your strongest point in, in the middle of the park. And I, I thought it was an odd one, but the substitutions Newcastle made, the, the likes of, I thought Hall and Anderson were, were exceptional. Hall was brilliant when he came on. His his, his positivity, he, he looked like he's, he's. You mentioned this in post match that he, he started to look more defensively sound. But I think you you also touch on the, the the aggression, the that bully nature that sort of Anderson plays with that little bit of swagger in midfield that he comes in and puts himself about. It's been massively missing, and and I know I mentioned this to you. I think off offline, but I thought that brought the better side of Sean Longstaff out as well towards the end of the game where he's suddenly allowed to go and play a little bit further forward without the defensive, without those those ties that maybe he's, he's had on. He looked a little bit more free. Um, and, and maybe, I know you, you've gone with a different lineup for for tomorrow, but, but even playing sort of Anderson, Longstaff and Bruno, I think that kind of suits Longstaff better because he's got that little bit of physicality in the other side of the midfield from from Anderson, but I, I thought both of those were were really really good as well, and and, and really they were the start. Um, but the Barnes substitution was the was the big change. Yeah, I mean, I think Anderson's gone under the radar <laughs> from a lot of people. Actually, I think you know in, in terms of his performance, I, I thought he was absolutely brilliant when he came on. I mean, as you said there, the physicality. I mean, he, he threw. I said this in post match. He threw Mikel Antonio. On his arse, and he's built like a heavyweight boxer. And you think, how oh, the hell is Elliot Anderson? Yeah, you know, Elliot Anderson's obviously just been beast in the gym, probably alongside Callum Wilson. The sad thing is, Wilson's hurt himself, probably lifting all their weights. But um, Anderson just seems to be this absolute monster of a player now. And you know, he, he's always had that technical, you know, technical skill and stuff for like that. But he's really filled out, and he's he's really, really 
aggressive now as, as a footballer. And he, I think there's a few times he's come on in recent weeks where he hasn't got the ball and, you know, dropped a shoulder and skinned somebody or, or done a little something here or there. He's just flattened somebody. And, it, you know, it's like that Roy Keane noise, isn't it? When he goes, me, just smash into somebody, make myself feel better. It's a, it's a little bit like that with, with Elliot Anderson at the minute. And I'm just, I'm really impressed with, with what he's offering the, the, the team. I mean, I, I think to be fair, Mark, you're probably in the minority, um, given Sean Longstaff, any real credit, you know, from from that game. He, 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 you know, Sean's a lovely lad and he's done wonders for this football club, but I thought he was relatively anonymous, mate, if I'm brutally honest with you. Um, in all fairness, huge shout out to this lad who put in a much better shift than Sean Longstaff, the ball boy uh, who refused to give up his seat for kudos for the shitty second goal, which we're going to come under in a minute, which I'm well still done, very son. happy about. But this kid, if this kid isn't given professional terms right now from that, then he, you know, I don't know what's wrong with anyhow. Signed the lad up on an eight-year contract. That was absolutely superb. I did say that. I was watching it, obviously, on the TV, and I think I said, did, did kudos just try and square up to the ball boy? And I didn't realise that was his signature celebration. The ball boy went, what, mate? No, you're all right. You're not getting the seat, which was just was just one of the highlights of the game, no doubt about But going back to, to Anderson, I think he deserves that start. <laughs> exactly, George. Leave those kids alone. Um, I think going back to Anderson, he deserves that start with the energy that he's putting into the to the game. I said this in, in the match preview as well for the Everton game. We need to start aggressively. We need to start on the front foot. We need to be two goals up, not two goals down. And I think start with Anderson is, is the right way. We haven't got enough time for Sean to, you know, meander his way into a game anymore. You know, it's not he needs to be dropped for me, but you know, I don't think you will drop him because. I'm starting to think that, you know, Longstaff and Dan Byrne could have one leg missing and anyhow we'll play them regardless, really. But uh, you know, Dan Byrne, I thought, looked a bit better when he, when he stepped inside more. But, but going back to, to Lewis Hall, we talked about him uh, post-match as well. He just he just looked so calm when he come on. We You know, we were we were chasing a game. The pressure was on. The, the crowd were, were a little bit up and down. Weren't there? there was moments where the ground was really flat. You know, and, and that can be real high pressure for a 19-year-old lad. Fucking hell, he didn't look like he was feeling pressure at all, Mark. He, no. His touch, his movement, you know, and the tackles he put on. I mean, Kudis didn't get a kick when Lewis Hall came on. I, I thought he was absolutely sensational. And if the lad isn't starting against Everton, honestly, I'll be absolutely astounded, man. Yeah, he, I think he's he's shown now he deserves he deserves that chance. And you're right, you, you mentioned Dan Byrne, you know, and we've guilty of it, but we we along with others have have, have called out Dan Byrne for, for his performances, particularly at left back. And I think moving inside suited him massively. And I thought I give Dan Byrne his credit. I thought he played really, really well at centre back. He, he wasn't he, did. he wasn't outstanding. He wasn't, you know. Man of the match, but he, he put in a really solid performance. I thought he had a good one. And look, we're we're always give players their credit when they do their credit, and we'll call them, you know, we'll we'll call them when they when they're not. And I, I think Dan Byrne deserves an awful lot of credit for his performance moving inside. The back four looked shaky when um when the cells went and then Kraft came on. He didn't particularly have a good performance. Um I don't think it suited the the full change around that that happened. I, I think in hindsight, the, the the better decision would have been to bring Lewis Hall on and and, and keep Tino yeah, that was, back. That was a real error. That one, I can't work that one out, mate. It was a really no, weird call. That it's. I mean, when you, you look at some of the, the performances Tino's put in at left back earlier on in the season, I sort of half understand it, mm. but. The way that Hall entered the game and the way that he, he played, you look back and you think that there is a big, a big mistake at that point. But you know, credit to them, they they turned it round, they got themselves sorted, um, and they did look much better. And funnily enough, when when Cher was feeling it and he, he was, he looked like he was struggling to run and keep up and stuff. He actually played better, um, and you know, it, it, it was just a a strange one that but yeah they give them give them credit i thought they they did play particularly well um it's sort of the the likes of burn um but yeah lewis hall coming on i mean he, he didn't miss a beat he he got the ball he drove forward he, he was he was sharp in the challenges he didn't give kudos a minute um he didn't give bowen a, a second anytime anybody was across that side he was on them he he defended really really well i think he he has to have put his name on the team sheet for tomorrow night now Surely he's, he's got some lovely give and goes as well with his movement and, and getting forward. And you, you could see Bowen and Kudos worried about what Hall was going to do the other way. And I think that's 
that's the what a proper modern day fullback does, you know. And, and obviously with Dan Burnley, only really gets to the halfway line. And if he gets in his own, you know, so if he gets in their half, he's, he's going to struggle to get back into his own. But yeah, I thought Lewis Hall was was absolutely brilliant, breath of fresh air. We've got Billy in the comments. Billy from the Toon Review. I did watch uh, Paul and Billy. Um, after the game, uh, doing the uh, the match commentary, I'm surprised you've just recovered, Billy. To be fair, God, you guys were up and down, bouncing all over the place. But Billy says, really good game. Glad Moy's negativity succumbed to Eddie's positive changes, even if some of them were injury enforced. Yeah, I mean, you're right, Billy. We we've give Eddie shit as well for for not being quick enough in game, Mark. But credit to him, he even came out and said he got the craft sub wrong. You know, and and I think that shows a great bit of humility from Eddie Howe that that he's willing to say that. And also that'll do Hall's confidence really well. Uh, you know, really boost them up. And there's been a lot of talk now about apparently Hall's been doing all his work behind the scenes and training, really working on his defensive um, part of his game. And you can see that when he come on. You know, he, I remember Lewis Hall against Dortmund where I can't remember the name of the winger now, it begins with an M, and the ball bounced and he looked the wrong way and the lad was round him. And I thought, that's that's the part of your game that Eddie Howe doesn't like, Lewis Hall. There was none of that on Saturday when he come on. He just looked, he looked like he belonged on that pitch. And as you say, Mark, he has to, has to start the next game. He really, really does. And, and if he does as good of a shift against Everton, he's got to stay in the team. He really has to stay in the team. But those substitutions were absolutely brilliant. Uh, we'll, we'll get we'll get into the, the, the main one, the quarter headlines in a minute, because I'm going to go on a little, uh, you know, uh, two or three minute love love uh, rant on uh, on Mr. Barnes, because he's been absolutely amazing when he's come on. But <laughs> yeah, that's the one, Malin. Thank you, Daniel. But, thank you. So they, they were the, those were the good bits of the game, Mark. Let's not forget, Newcastle were 3-1 down here. There, there was some bad bits of this game as well. But but before we get into the bad bits, there were some really big calls in this game that changed this game. A lot of controversy around them. Uh, for me, I know my point of view, and I think me and you are probably on the same page here. But let's start with a big one. As soon as the game kicked off, more or less, the first penalty. Great work by Anthony Gordon, in my opinion, to get his body in the way of the ball. Penalty yeah. for you, mate? Yeah, I, I think so. I think he, he gets... I mean, you you only have to look at that. He's 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 close enough to the ball now. There's maybe a difference of opinion for the second one. I can I can understand why it was given. I'll come to that in a second. But this one definitely there's a the definite play for the ball from Gordon in that regard. He gets himself in front of the defender. The defender plays through the back of Anthony Gordon at this point. It's it's a stonewall penalty. That's that's given every day of the week. I don't I don't see any issue with that at all. Um, then no, no, there should be no complaints about that one. Um, and those two West Ham fans up in the in the stand complaining about um, <laughs> referees being referee. bribed and stuff. Fuck's sake, man, honestly. Well, um, Ian's right, Kufo went right through the back of him. You could, you could yeah. tell by his face when he hit the deck, he knew it was a bad tackle, he knew it was yeah. a silly tackle to do it. Yeah, and the thing this, this is modern day football, you know. We're going to repeat myself on the on the next penalty mark as well in a second, but this is modern day football. This is a quick, intelligent player, knowing if he gets his body in the way of the player in the ball, it's going to be contact, and there's a good likelihood he's going to get a penalty. And that's exactly what Anthony Gordon did. A smart yeah. player, in my opinion. And and it's it's an area of the game that I think Gordon utilizes quite well, and it, it's part of the dark arts, isn't it? And and I think sometimes Newcastle have been guilty of not being able to not being able to to utilize the dark arts. They've they've they've, they've got better at it, um, particularly with the likes of Joe Linton when he's there. Um, you, you see an awful lot of it, but but Gordon's <laughs> good at it. Gordon's good at yeah. getting himself in between the ball. Um, and the player, almost Jack Grealish-esque in that regard. Grealish is very, very good at protecting the ball, and players then have to go through him. There's a, there's an awful lot of of that around um, Anthony Gordon, and, he, and he's he's learning to to do that. Um, he gets pelters from opposition fans. He gets pelters from from others that are watching the game. But to me, that's it's smart, but it's not. It, this one in particular, I don't think I don't think there's any argument with this one. This one is a is a stonewall penalty. Um, absolutely. Well, let's get on the second one. Let's just we'll jump to the the second the second penalty for us just before we get into the the, the ridiculousness of the other goal. Um, so so obviously Calvin Phillips comes on, and we're going to talk about Calvin Phillips now at tune because I do have a little bit of sympathy with him, but he was pretty crappy. He looked like that pub team player that got on at three in the morning 
on a Sunday and you go, you stink a drink. What, what time would you get in, you fucking dickhead? And then he comes off the bench, he just looks like he's going to vomit and then he gives away foul after foul. And that's kind of like how Calvin Phillips looked on uh, on Saturday. But for me, okay, you're taking him out on this mark. For me, this is harsh. However, these are the rules of the game these days. Now, Gordon has been really clever here. We've seen that Phillips is dilly-dallying on the ball. So, he's again, he's got his foot in between Phillips and the ball. Phillips is trying to clear the ball, which he should have done probably about half a second earlier. And because Gordon's been quick enough, quicker than him, to get his foot in there, he's then been taken out. And for me, that, that's another penalty mark. I, I, that's a, it's, it's a harsh one. But the modern-day rules of football state well, that's a penalty. And do you know what? If that was at the other end of the park, West Ham would be screaming for a penalty as well, in my opinion. They, they absolutely would. And I understand why this is given. I don't think it's a penalty. I, I go the other end and I go, if this happens at the other end, you're screaming that this isn't a penalty. For me, there's Gordon gets his leg in the way. I don't think that there's 100% an effort to play the ball from Anthony Gordon here. It's an effort just to get himself in the way. Um, yeah. And, and I think that this one's really harsh. And, and I, I agree. I've got to be honest, I agree with an awful lot of the uh, of comments from from neutral um, sort of pundits and, and fans that had said that it's almost a foul the other way because Gordon, his only sort of point that is he prevents Phillips from clearing the ball. He's, he's far enough away. He, he doesn't, he's not close enough to have really made a play of the ball. His only effort there is to just get in the way. Um, and like I say, I can understand why it's given. Because after the first one's given, I think that one gets given. I, I don't think, you, you know, you look at them both. It's still very, very subjective. I, I'm not sure. Um, but, yeah, for me, like you celebrate the fact that it was given for you and you, and you take the you take the second goal and, and, and the march on then to the, the three points. But that's, for me, that's not, that's not stone cold like the other one is. Uh, it's really not. No, I mean, to be fair, we should say as well, Isaac put both pens away with a plum, really. They, 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 were, they were really, really good. But the, there was somebody who had, a, had an opinion about this penalty. There was a lot of people who had an opinion about this penalty, but there was a familiar face who had an opinion about this penalty. And uh, he decided to take to uh, take to Twitter to uh, to talk about it. We'll just quickly jump down there from there. So Jeff Stelling said, uh, you know, I love NUFC, but it's clearly not a C. Well, this is, sorry, this is the second one. This is the, the second. This is this the pen. We'll, well, we'll get no, into no. that. But he, he did question the pen. I just seen Jeff Stelling there. So he did question the pen. And then Alan Shearer duly shot him down and said, uh, that's because it's a pen, Jeff. So I was quite impressed with the fact that even though Shearer's retired 18 years, he's still getting them on target and knocking Jeff Stelling back in his box, who, who has turned a bit bell endish since he's gone to talk sports, suffice to say. But we, we will get on to the, the second goal now. So for me on this one, I don't know if you've got the slide there, Mark, to pull it up. But So obviously after it goes 1-1, after Mikel Antonio breaks through, uh, which again is a, ball, a simple dink over the top. We don't deal with it properly. We'll get on to the Bravka in a minute and his his faults. I know you're chopping it a bit to talk about how shit or oh, cracker hands was, in all fairness. You know, Harvey Bonds didn't just say very how he say fucking Dubravka as well. But going on to this whole head injury thing. Now, obviously, Cher comes up the, the arse of kudos and he throws his hand back and he gives him a clip in the nose. And yes, it's a bit, you know, theatrical. And, and Fabian Cher has a bad reputation for going down and holding his head, you know, nine times a game or something like that. It wouldn't be a Newcastle game without Fabian Cher rolling around holding his handsome face at one point, pretending he's been hit by somebody. But it doesn't change the fact the rules of the game are if somebody's got a head injury, you have to stop the play. Now, Paquetta had a head injury and rolled around just like this, probably about 15 minutes earlier, as you can see from the slide there, and they stopped the game. Rob Jones stopped the game. He didn't. He didn't stop and the that, game. And, that, and that's the point. And, and I think that's what a lot of West Ham fans I thought saying. he stopped the game. No, I he, he didn't. stopped the game. Ah, Newcastle, well, Newcastle played on, so and and I think this is part of the the, the argument back and forwards. For me, I mean, when you but it when wasn't you a watched, free kick though. It wasn't a free kick. It was no, open play. When you when you watch the when you watch the one from Paqueta, it, it's Bruno's hand that goes back, and yeah. it, and, it, and it gets him there. So I, I can understand he's gone down holding his face. He's not touched him, and if it is a touch, it, it's it's like a feather touching him. It, it's really not. 
This one, it's a full hand in the face. Full now, smack in the face. He could have broke his ref- nose or something for, for all well, you this, know. This, this was kind of going to be my point because the referee doesn't know how hard that impact was. It doesn't know how it's caught him on the nose. It could have broken his nose, in which case that's a, a more serious head injury. And I know it, it, Cher's reputation probably goes against him in this regard because he does go down holding his head an awful lot. In fairness, he gets kicked in the head an awful lot of times. Um, and... I just think it's worked against him in this regard. And the, the referee, I mean, the referee's looking at him at this point. Um, it's it, it just seems ludicrous the fact that you you've allowed the free kick to to be taken while there's still a player injured on the floor, you know, holding his face, and he has clearly been been struck in the face. It's not like this one where Paquette has gone down holding his face when the when the actual contact is really somewhere around his chest and shoulder region. So the, the two are different, but I can kind of understand the West Ham's argument West Ham West Ham fans argument at this point is saying the referee played on here, so he's just allowed play to go on here. But I'm sorry, head injuries head injuries the, the, the ref isn't a doc. He's not a medic. He doesn't he doesn't know how hard that blow was. That that should have been prevented until it been you know, determined whether or not Fabian Cher was was injured or not. Yeah, well, I'm I'm really worried about player safety with this kind of a thing. I mean, there's play acting, as you said there, with Paquetta. Then for this one, I mean, more so the reason that they gave West Ham a free kick. So West Ham have got a free kick. Rob Jones actually goes over to look at Fabian Cher, who's on the floor, still holding his face. There's two or three Newcastle players around him, obviously, probably catching a breather, checking he's all right. I know Sean's saying play the whistle, which I do agree with a little bit, Sean. I'll get onto that in a second. But but the fact that Paquetta looks at Bowen and says, are you ready? And then he plays the ball and three or four Newcastle players haven't even woken up yet. Fabian Scher's still on the floor holding his face, as you rightly say, Mark, for all the, the ref knows. I mean, look at that one that happened to, you know, Jimenez, you know, a clash of heads, those kind of things. You don't know what how severe the head injury is to somebody or the face injury is to somebody. Could have broke his nose, could have gouged his eye, could have been anything. Rob Jones has come over to check on him. He's let them take a, take the penalty quickly. They've then gone through, I think only Livermento and um, Byrne actually wake up and try and do something about it. Kudos takes a shot. Dubravka's got to do better, in my opinion, as well. We'll get back to that in a second. But for me, that goal should not have stood. The ref should have blown the whistle and made them take the free kick again, and he totally bottled it, mate. Yeah, I, I can't disagree with that. I, I I do think when when you when you watch back and it, it, it's a clear strike to the face. How hard that was, we don't know because we're not there. But you can clearly see it's a strike to the face. It should have been stopped. But Newcastle players have to be a lot more switched on. With, with yeah, kind of it's a, you, you've got to be looking at it, going what if, what if, what if, and if the, if. West Ham play the ball, which they do. The Newcastle players have got to be ready. They've got to be set to, to go. If, if you know, the, the players are allowed to go on, and they weren't. Um, and yes, Kevin, he, he did mean a free kick. <laughs> he, did, he did mean a free kick. But, but to be fair, I think Joe Cole said it really well in uh, in Punditry. Deal with it first, moan about it afterwards. You know, and, that, and that's what Newcastle should have done. They should have dealt with it then, moaned about it. But as soon as the goal went in, I think Byrne ran towards the ref, um, I think Tino did, I think Kraft did. They all went and shouted and moaned at the referee, but he had no intention of changing his, his decision at all. But but it, it is quite disappointing because there's no consistency once again with these referees. We'll see a decision like that given for somebody and they'll rule a goal out next week, you know what I mean, or, or, or midweek or something like that. And you think, well, where's the consistency? So I think Eddie Howe was fuming on the sideline, and rightly so. He had a right to fume about that. Now, had Fabian Scher been really injured with that and had a bad head injury, I mean, they, you know, Newcastle quite rightly could have wrote to PGMOL and said, what the hell are you doing there? You know what I mean? Like, you're, you're going to cost my players safety there. You know, the, yeah. the only people who are allowed to put our players at, safe, uh, at risk is Newcastle United themselves because we do it on a regular basis by making them come back on the pitch with Achilles injuries. You know, that's what we do on a regular basis. We don't need help from the PGMOL to do that. You know, we injure our own players. We don't <laughs> need your help as well. But but it was, it, it was ludicrous. But... As we say, the game, the game transpired. We'll, we'll get on to Harvey Barnes in a second, but we're going to the ugly side of this. So we go 3-1 down, and you can blame gaps in the defence. I mean, the third goal in particular, Mark, was just dreadful from a defensive point of view. I don't know if you've got yeah. the slide for that, but, but Martin, De, Martin Dubravka in particular, he's soft on the second goal. He's 
got to have a stronger hand behind that. And then in the third goal, Mark, he's just glued to his line. Well, I'm going to start at the beginning, and I'm going to start with the first one because to Ooh. me, Dubravka get this, goals. get gets this, this all wrong. You can see his starting position is around the the, the penalty spot, and, and I actually think it's a great starting position for that. You could argue maybe he should be further out. He's not a goalkeeper that likes to play too far out. And I would understand that if he's a little bit further out and Antonio gets the ball where he is or closer to where he is at this point, he's the furthest player forward, he, he could easily launch the ball over the top of the goalkeeper. So I, I understand this this um, this starting position. Now, this is the, the ball at this point is just going past Antonio's head and it's going to skip forwards. So my, my my read of this would be for, for Dubravka to stay relatively close to where he is now or slightly further forward if he reads the ball coming forward. Now, the follow one, this is the first touch Antonio takes. Now, look at where the ball's come from. Look at where the ball passes Antonio's head. This is at this particular point. And this is Antonio's first touch of the ball. At this point, Dubravka has gone at least five yards further backwards. He's almost now Why? given up. I, I don't understand this at all. I mean, this was a starting position that you have to even sort of see the faded out version of, of Dubravka. To be honest with you, they may as well have been that faded out version of him. But he takes that <laughs> Martin step. McFly. Those, no, my Martin McFly. Martin McFly. Martin McFly. Honestly. <laughs> but he takes those steps backwards. So he's now on his six yard box with Antonio bearing down on him with the ball on the edge of the box. He could have been much further forward. And at this point, as Antonio's get, he could have closed that down. Now, Antonio would only have one way to go. Because of the defender closing down, he can't skip to the left. And he's taken the ball on his right-hand side. So he's going to go to his right and Dubravka's left. In this in this regard, he has to take a, a step or two forward. And the, the ultimate point of this is, the, the other side is, he's actually to the right of the penalty spot. So he's opened up the goal to be, you know, to allow Antonio to play the ball into that, which is exactly what happens. And the point in which he strikes the ball, he's only another yard off the, the six-yard box. He should be at least another yard or two further forward and, and slightly more towards his left to narrow down that angle. And it's absolutely, it's just it's woeful goalkeeping. And this is it is he's th- it is poor from craft as well. This is, this is, it is poor this from Kraft as well. Stuff. It is because yeah, Kraft, yeah, Kraft is, is the as one bad as he's him. been. Yeah, we've got a couple of comments yeah. there just saying how crap Kraft's market was. And he was Kraft was shit when he came on. That was the big reason he came off as well. But you are right, Mark. The Bravka's glued to his line so much. Nick Nick Pope's quicker out than that. He sweeps up quicker than that. And I think that's one of the biggest things we miss with the Bravka in goal. There's no coincidence we've conceded as many goals as we have with the Bravka in goal because of shit like this. And I think it needs to be it needs to be highlighted like you're doing there, mate. Yeah. And then you, you go on, so you get to the third one. Now, this comes, this stems from Newcastle oh. attacking it. What gets me? And the reason I've, I've highlighted Gordon is just purely because of the, the, the amount of ground that that, that kid covers. Pace. But Newcastle have attacked there. There are nine players ahead of the ball at this point when Kudos has it. The amount of pace in that in that West Ham forward line, I, I'm sorry, but Livermento should not be on his own near the halfway line. Bowen's allowed to be completely free. So when the ball balls played across, he just has the entirety of, of St. James's part. I mean, I've, I've highlighted that box that he's in. Oof, there's, there's, no one near him. there's no one anywhere that's near awful. him. But then you move it on. And again, the closest player to him, Livermento's obviously still there. Look at where Anthony Gordon's come from to, to, oh, to guess back into it. Pure He's design to get player. back, man. Absolutely right. And he nearly does it. But again, look at Dubravka's positioning. He's stuck inside his six-yard box with the ball pretty much straight on. He's on the left-hand side of the box, uh, the left-hand side of the goal. Sort of, he's not central. He's allowed Jared Bowen to be able to play that ball into the corner. Do you watch it back and watch the the kind of front on view of it? He gets no. He shows him the, the angle, doesn't he? He almost shows he, he him. Completely he completely opens the goal up to yeah. him. To, and there and, you go, mate. Bottom corner. <laughs> The one thing that I kind of wanted to bring up, and this is, it's a bit of a, this is something that I learned when I was eight years old. There's your triangle. To narrow the narrow down the goal, this is something I was shown as a kid when I was first learning how to be a goalkeeper. Yeah. If you, you just open the door for a striker to be able to place the ball into a bottom corner, the closer you are to the goal. Yeah. 
and and you go back to that again. It's just a point. If he if if Debravka is three two three yards further forward, he saves that because the 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 angle is completely narrowed down, and and he, you know he, he, he's, it's just. It's so basic, and I, I don't understand how a 35-year-old international goalkeeper doesn't understand this or isn't confident enough to do this. It's, it's dreadful, absolutely dreadful. And I, I agree that the defenders, the defending for, for both goals, I think, is, is, is pretty awful. This one in particular, I think, I say, with the amount of pace that West Ham have up front... The fact that they've left one defender back is absolutely shocking. But the yeah, goalkeeper is criminal. It's it's just awful. It, it really is. But but thankfully, Mark, thankfully, and then a lovely little segue into our next section. This stuff didn't matter. Thanks very much to a player who come off the bench and was absolutely bang at it in every possible way. Harvey Barnes. Wow. I mean. This kid has taken some grief this season. He's had a he's had a pretty crap season, which is mental when you think about it. He's only he's only played about thirteen um, games or something. He's got four goals. <laughs> so he's actually got a, incredible stats for someone who's barely played. But he's had obviously injuries, freak injuries, and everything else. He, he once again he looked like a player who was rushed back too quick. You know, and he didn't quite look like the Harvey Barnes that we you know we, we knew he could be. The Harvey Barnes was saw in pre season. Um, this Harvey Barnes, who came off the bench, and he only comes off the bench because Miggy Almiron gets injured. Now, we'll give Miggy some credit. When he come on, Miggy um, carved out a couple of lovely chances. The, the long staff and he's at both spectacularly fluffed, um, you know, horrendously bad. Um, but Miggy was looking all right, and then he pulls up another injury, and you're thinking, fuck, you're taking a piss. And it's so fortuitous because Barnes wouldn't have come on that earlier, he would have come on a little bit later, maybe for Gordon or something like that. You know, if he hadn't got sent off, obviously, yeah, which was bullshit, by the way. I think, you know, that that second yellow was very harsh. Shouldn't have kicked the ball away, but I think it was very harsh in the context of the game. But going back to Harvey Barnes, this is the, the step up in quality. I said this in post-match. This guy doesn't fuck around. It's touch, bang, you know, shot, gets his shot off. He's on the pitch for, what was he, 20 minutes, 25 minutes. He has four shots all on target. The first one, he goes in the back stick with a left foot volley. Keeper saves it. The goal, the first goal, I don't know if you've got really him on the slides. Well, we're yeah, talking about goals, it's a very good save. save. I don't know if you've got his goals in the slides or not, but the first the first goal, Isaac drops into that, that little hole. Um, there we go. He drops in that little bit of space. And this is what I was saying in post-match. This is the difference between a top quality player. Now, Almiron's maybe running around chasing his tail at this point, right? Maxi's was when he was here, was doing dances or something on the, you know, on the sideline or little weird rainbow flicks or something like that. But the minute Isaac drops in that space and gets the ball, Harvey Barnes bends that run. He knows exactly what he's doing and he makes such a great one. And the finish mark for the first goal, how clinical is that finish? We'll get into the second one, but the first goal, what a finish, man. But they keep yeah. rushing out here. He, he he's very very clever. He 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 can see the line here. He, he's such a he's such a clever footballer, Harvey Barnes. And, and you know the the a little bit like the the West Ham goal. The 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 right back is is the player that's caused all the problems for for the defending side. Because you look at the other three defenders, they are in a line. They're playing that 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 line well to to sort of keep the offside. And unfortunately, is it Sufal that's, that's playing right back? He he, he completely gets sucked deep. Um, and Barnes is allowed to, to run on the line of the other defenders. And it, oh, what a pass. What a pass from Isaac with his left foot. Oh, brilliant ball. Um, brilliant to ball. play it through that gap. And it's perfectly weighted to, to get in the the path of, of that Harvey Barnes run. And you watch it again, and he he, he, he's got, he looks down, he looks up, he, he, he assesses where the goalkeeper is and exactly what he needs to do, the way that the goalkeeper is, is, is positioned and the way his feet are. And it's just such a clinical finish. It really That's the is. comment there from Dave. He makes that run before Isaac even gets the ball because he, he knows, knows what's, what's coming. coming. That's and the Isaac, quality of player, isn't it? And exactly. And, and Isaac is such a clever footballer that he knows exactly what Harvey Barnes is going to want to do. He knows his position so that the ball through that gap, he's got nobody in front of him. There's no risk of that being stopped. And he just weights it perfectly. It's such a good finish. I, I, I mean, I kind of overstate that. It's such a, it's such a tremendous finish. Um, and then the second one, it's just oh, oh mate, the second, with the, the pressure second. on, 
Oh, uh, man. Yeah. No, if, if you j- just, just allow me one second, because I've watched this goal over and over and over again. And I know Calvin Phillips is getting a real battering here, right? But it's the swivel of the hips that does him. It's, it's absolutely fucking top draw. It's top draw Premier League quality. He just... He gets that ball off Gordon, and it's just that little quick movement. Barnes is uh, sorry, uh, Phillips has no idea what he's doing, and he's gone. And to whip it with such pace and power in the bottom corner that is a kid with all a massive confidence. He's shown us all what he can do, you know. And, and do you know what? Massive credit to Harvey Barnes because he would have heard fans doubting him, he would have been thinking, Fucking, I've been injured for ages. I know, I need to show these fans what I'm all about. He seems like a genuinely really lovely lad, doesn't he? He's got loads about him, you know. He seems like a really sound kid. And I tell you what, Mark, seeing what he can do, he's criminally underused at a national level, by the way, because who who in an England squad can do stuff like that? He's got that Frank Lampard running ability of just finding space. But when he gets there, boy, how would he can the kid finish? And that was an unbelievable strike, mate. Unbelievable. Yeah, he's he, he, as Sean just put in the comments there, he knows what he's going to do even before he's got the ball. Yeah. And you're absolutely right. And I, I do think that if, if Barnes can can now play through the rest of the season um, and he's going to, hopefully, I, I guess, he, he's going to put a run together where he, he will score goals. He's going to put himself in the in the argument for the England squad. And he, and he should be. He should definitely be in there when he's fit because he, he does just give you a little bit of something different. He's not a Grealish. He's not a Foden. He's so direct. You know, he... he He's looking for that opportunity to get the ball on his right foot usually and, and put the ball in the back of the net. Um, and it's, he's, he's like I said before, he's just so clever. And that that little touch, uh, and credit to, to Gordon as well on that left-hand side as well that sort of sets him, but that little touch to just dink inside of, of Calvin Phillips, who doesn't know what day of the week it is at the moment. Oh, he really does All over the place. But the just the confidence to be able to hit that shot the way that he does, um, it's it's sensational and and, and and worthy of winning any game. Oh, absolutely! And you know, the, I mean, I, I always say I hate that comment when people talk about um, you know being in the ground and, and everything else. But I would have loved to have been in the ground for that goal. I was in the ground when Bruno scored his last minute one against Leicester where he nearly took his fucking pants off as well. And that was just mental. The whole place went nuts. But but Harvey Barnes, the hip swivel, hyperbole, I love a hip swivel. Like, absolutely. You know, the hip swivel is, uh, you know, that's when you do it right. You know, Max used to do it on the halfway line with nobody around him. This this kid's doing it and scored rakers from 20 yards, man. Do you know what I mean? It's just... Speaking of Maxi, have you seen the clip that's doing the rounds of them trying to absolutely. do the little bunny hop with a ball? Jesus. Oh, man. my God. God, weirdest, weirdest thing I've ever seen. I know he's played in a bit of a pub league, but fucking hell. Yeah, Darren saying Miggy versus compar- uh, Miggy versus Barnes comparison. There is no comparison. There is no comparison. This, this lad is levels above Miggy Almiron. Absolutely levels above. Davey saying terrific pass by Isaac. He made some lovely... He, he did. He looked really good, didn't he, Davey, on Saturday, Isaac? He just, it's all around play. We're, we're going to get on to uh, a certain Erling Haaland and our tune. Um we will get there, guys. We've been even talking about an hour about the game and Harvey Barnes. But, you know, Isaac's overall play was just sensational. And damn right, the club have come out and said they're not going to sell him. You know, they're going to build a team around him. And two, right, because this lad is the best centre forward we've had since Alan Shearer, mate. And all around play is, is just sensational. It really is. But but as you rightly say, Mark, an unbelievable finish, Um, you know, yeah. to, to a game and a great goal from Harvey Barnes. I was just trying to find something actually on Twitter. I'm sure somebody said that Harvey Barnes' goal to game ratio, I think, is up there with the likes of Andy Cole in the Premier League or something daft like that. I'm sure I've heard this somewhere. I don't know if I dreamt this. Um, he's got, certainly this season, in terms of per 90 minutes played this season, he's got four goals and 4.3 games. <laughs> yes, that's <laughs> pretty good. That's phenomenal. <laughs> um, this so, season, yeah. anyway. It's, you know, it's one, last, one last thing on Barnes before we move on. Honest to God, I think if this kid had been fit all season, he'd have 15 goals by now. I think he'd have 15 Probably. goals because he's that good of a... And he would walk in that England team. He really, really would. Ironically enough, he might have took Gordon's place in all fairness. But but yeah, a great way to finish the game, as you rightly say, mate. You know, as, as Travis is there, the noise for the fourth was spying tingling. It, it really, really was. Uh, I think we've all watched it back, you know, hundreds and hundreds of times. Did you see that weird thing as well, that this 4-3 game, 
it actually reminded me of that. I, I think I maybe said it to you. Reminded me of the Leicester game where we beat Leicester four three years ago and Shearer got Harry. Ah, oh, look at that, just as but it's if by magic. And all the goals were exactly the same time. That's spooky as fuck, isn't it? Isn't it? Yeah, I I, I found somebody on and I, I can't remember who it was I, to give them credit that put this on 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 Twitter. Um, and when I saw, it, I was just like, that's bizarre, utterly bizarre. To, to, to for the same result to happen as well. Yeah. Um, Hang on, I've found the Barnes stats. I found them right. So here we go. So Harvey Barnes averages. You're going to tell me this is wrong here. Of Harvey Barnes averages 0.61 uh, GA per 90 across his career. For reference, that puts him in the top 30 players in the Premier League since the turn of the century. Andy Cole, 0.63. Cristiano Ronaldo, 0.65. Gareth Bale, 0.53. All around him. That is pretty bloody good company to be in, by the way, isn't it, for Harvey Barnes? It's not, uh, it's not, it's not a bad record, is it? 38 million's a snip, mate. It's a bloody I, snip. I think what a play. If, yeah, I think he, look, he's, he's been massively missed, um, given the you know, given the injury this season. But look, what a, I mean, that's that's that is some record, really, isn't it? That is brilliant. And what, and, and honestly, let's just hope he stays fit for the last nine games because he could be a huge player in terms of Newcastle getting European qualification. But we'll move on and we'll be talking about Harvey Barnes all night. There was uh, some more injuries at the weekend, Mark, as we know. Obviously, Jamal LaSalle's was the big one. He's out six to nine months with a, another Achilles injury. Miggy went down again. These injuries are getting fucking ridiculous. We just recorded a, a video, which will go out in the next few days, uh, about the uh, the internal investigation. But, Mark, you've got an injured 11 uh, th- this is this is frightening. This this is probably better than the starting eleven. This team, isn't it? Well, this this is it's a missing eleven because because a couple missing of missing eleven are, 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 suspe- are suspended. But I mean, you look at oh, that and you yeah, think, well, look at that, if if obviously Livermore is going to be injured and Trippy is not back for the Everton game, this is the this is the side that could be available for Everton but isn't. And you look and just go, Jesus, that's midfield three. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Riley, Tanali, and Joe Linton. We look at you. I mean, look at the front three. Do you know what I mean? It's just, it's yeah. unbelievable that that's the level of of players they're missing. For Newcastle at the moment, and it's it just it's staggering. Eddie Howe's not missing. I just left him on there from from the from the previous team sheet, so he, he isn't missing. Just don't, don't want to panic anybody. He, he um, has been but, missing in some games, mate. He has been missing in some well, games. That, I think is Eddie Howe this season. To, be that, to me, that I mean, that's just. It goes to show the level of problems that there is that there are at the club this season because there's just so many. You just it's just ridiculous. Honestly, I've never seen anything like it. It really Nothing is. Like it. Davy says that it's, it's it's mental. I mean, this investigation definitely needs to happen because something is not right. I mean, even in all fairness, you know, um, Lascelles going back on when he, he's clearly done. It's just weird, and you have to look at the the touchline for that and ask ask who's who's advising them to do that. Just very, very strange. But there's some serious things that need to be looked at. Um, I think, you know, with regards to injuries and and um, you know, recovery and everything that we do for players, because there's been a lot of recurrence of injuries and relapses, and it's just not good. It really, really isn't. But yeah, more injuries to contend with. But you know, the team that finished the game, I think, on Saturday finished really well. Uh, you know, and as as we said in the in the in the Everton preview, you know, I think if uh, if trips can get back. Is is good, you know. Lewis Hall definitely deserves that starting berth. Anis is looking good, you know. So we, we have got a little bit of an option in in different areas. And if Barnes can can have an impact like he did on Saturday, you know, we won't miss Anthony Gordon as much as we maybe could have done, you know, because of that uh, because of that suspension, mate. But uh, yeah, just um, long may this bloody injury ravaged season end. Really, I hope it ends in Europe. But my God, I'm absolutely sick, absolutely sick. I mean, one of one of the clips, and and this is the kind of the unlucky nature of this this whole whole thing. One of the one of the the, the sort of the images that I had was Tino's injury. I mean, you just can't legislate for stuff like this happening. And and Paqueta plays the ball off his right foot as he's trying to put his foot down, and he ends up with his foot like that as he puts it down. I mean, you, you this doesn't happen anywhere else. It's just I, I'm completely convinced that either the Somebody's, I know there's there's voodoo or something going on. I know it's been mentioned in the comments. Or, which doctors? there's some some curse, like the curse of the Billy Goat or something that went on in baseball for for seventy odd years. 
uh, something's gone right. It, it's just the, the amount of bad luck with injuries this season is just unbelievable for for the club. And honestly, just I, it's it's sta- things like that Livermental one. I mean, how many times do you see something like that? Just a ball. It's literally just a ball played off his foot and just happens to, you know, twist it as he goes to put it put it down. If the if the balance is on the other foot, he gets away with it because he can then readjust. But it's just because his foot's coming down. It's unreal, honestly. It's yeah, it's not good. Uh, maybe Mike Ashley was friends with a witch doctor or something like that, and they're just he's just snapping legs of players somewhere and uh, with Mike Ashley, you know, drinking uh, in one of them scabby local boozers that he used to he used to drink in. Uh, David saying, "Hey guys, did you hear them up on the Chronicle saying anyone who had a problem with the second West Ham goal has to have a word with themselves?" I thought that was hugely disrespectful. Lost a sub. Well, hopefully, lo- they lost a sub, not us, David, because uh, I wasn't very happy with the second goal. In all fairness. Um, but yeah, yeah there's, there's a lot of people talking about it. A lot of people talking about it. Uh, we've got Pages and Paul saying the range of weird injuries have been bizarre. Two shoulders, surgeries, two broken backs, chest muscle tear, a freak foot injury. And that's just Callum Wilson, isn't it? Fucking hell. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't resist. Sorry, Callum. Uh, but yeah, there has been some bizarre injuries. It really has. But I think, you know, again, not stepping on the video that we're going to do more, but it's the way we've handled it. They're letting players come back on in games that were in front in and and not moving not moving the squad around when people look like they're on their arse. That's that's been a contributing factor, I think, to burning these players out, you know? Well there, there was there's an argument for the weekend for the fact that um they haven't run the right tests on, on Lascelles before mm. he's allowed to go back on the field because they right. haven't done they haven't done the proper ACL test on him while he's on you know it's clearly a knee problem. Yes he comes off and, and you can there are other things that, or other things that go on within the knee that can mask what's going on for a short amount of time. Adrenaline, something that will will over um, would would kind of overwrite a, a little bit of that as well because it it prevents the it can prevent the, the the pain receptors and stuff. So, but from what I could see, they didn't. I'm not sure they they did the proper tests on him, and I think if they run the proper tests on him on the field, the, he'd the probably same. have not. He'd probably have knocked one of them out um, mm. because, honestly, when you go through something that I, and, and you do have a problem, and I've gone through it before, the pain is unbelievable. You know straight away at that point that you were completely done. You you can't go on. But it just didn't look like they'd, they'd done the right thing for him, and, and he was allowed to go back. I mean, he only lasted a couple of minutes before it was clear that he, he just couldn't couldn't continue. But again, it's another one where he's allowed to go back on the field and allowed to continue on for a couple of minutes. Joe Linton was exactly the same in, in the, the game against Sunderland where he came out yeah. after half time. Should never have come back on on never. the field. He should have been away to, to get himself sorted. Um but He could be when, back now. Mark, he could be back now if if he if that hadn't happened. I, I'm not so sure. I, I, I but I, it's it's just the look of it, it's the optics of it of the fact that he, he's allowed to come back on the field. And yes, he didn't do an awful lot in that in, in that little bit of time that he was on the field for. But it doesn't help. Botman's the same. Botman allowed to be to play on while he's got an ACL problem. And clearly he hasn't been fully fit for, for weeks and weeks. And I, I know there's a squad depth problem. I know there are, you know, the, there's a lack of availability for players in that area. But if you've got an ACL problem, it doesn't just fix itself while you're playing. You need time away. And and it, it for me, there's there seems to be an awful lot of that going on. Um, but look, I mean, Bottom is going to be out long term now. Lascelles is going to be out for the same length of time. There's not an awful lot left now. I mean, you you're running on sh- share. Um, he obviously he was pulling his hamstring towards the end of the game. Burns, Burns, uh, Burns dumb it. Dumb it. Um, That's great. I, I guess Kraft can can fill in at centre back if absolutely needed. There's not an awful lot else, and mm. you're looking at the likes of what Alex Murphy to to possibly drop in and and, and give some backup in that area too. I, I think this all runs into the summer to to be the the. The, the main focus now has got to be to to cover to cover the centre back problems because you know you, you're looking at the Botman being out for nine up to nine months. Lascelles now up for that as well. He's just had a bloody new contract extension, which doesn't help. I think if he hadn't have had that, I think he'd probably be away in the in the in the summer. 
but centre back's got to be a priority now because you, you can't go into next season with with two first teamers, um, and, and really one's on the they're both on the back end of their career now. Yeah, and I think you're right. There's definitely going to be movement. I think in the, in the centre half position in the summer as well as um, centre forward as well. I think just to get some cover for Isaac in case he gets injured again. Not only that, just to give him a chance to come out of the team rather than relentlessly playing. If we, if we do get European football, having Isaac putting his body through, you know, Premier League cup games and European competitions all through the seasons is not going to work. Not going to work at all. Yeah, I think uh, I did see Lloyd Kelly link Luke. What worries me about Lloyd Kelly? We have covered him before. Is uh, the injury history? Branthway, I think, is the lad you're talking about. I'd love Branthway at Newcastle. I think he would be superb. Obviously, there's a link with Anthony Gordon there as well. Just gone away in the England squad together. Obviously, you know, old Everton teammates and stuff like that. I know um, Kelly is a good player, as uh, as Kevin says there. But that injury uh, record does worry me, Mark. I know it's worried you before as well with with Lloyd Kelly. Well, we talked about it the other week, didn't we? I mean, he's missed 18 games the last two seasons as well, and and he's not going to be the answer. Um, to, no. to come in and be your, your, your starter or his injury problems behind him. I mean, it's it's almost asking for problems by bringing somebody like that in to, to, to play as a, you know, as a, as a starter. Branthway, I think, would be absolutely exceptional. Um, mm. he, he, he's such a good player. Um, so he, he'd be high on many teams' lists for, for the summer, but I think he's probably just gone up a couple of rungs on on Newcastle's priority list, I think. Absolutely. Davey's saying there we'll see Harrison on the bench tomorrow. Uh, you never know. He's been trained with the first team. You know, he could very well get a chance to to be in the squad um, tomorrow. You know, uh, to be fair, Joe Gomez would be a good signing. Uh, J7, I'm not sure, would, would get him from Liverpool. I don't think they would uh, they would release him. I don't think. I think he's, he's been quite key for him, hasn't he, this season? So I, He fills in well, but I think the emergence of the likes of Conor Bradley... At right mm. back, and uh, Gomez has played an awful lot of time at right back, where where Trent's True. been there, uh, and I think the the amount of time that that Gomez will get to play will will be really diminished with with you know the I'll take him. I'll is take it Canate and obviously and, and and Van Dijk? Yeah, definitely. I think I think he's he's a really solid solid defender and can play right across the back if you need to as well. But yeah, he, yeah. he'd certainly be one if you can get him for a decent price. Why not? He's, he's, yeah. he's certainly a step up on what's available at the moment. Um, who's, who's the other young lad who plays centre half and all for Liverpool? He was on loan at Bristol Rovers, wasn't he? Um, or is it is it Kwanzaa? Kwanzaa. Yeah, he was. Yeah. Uh, he played. Yeah, he was. He's 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 emerged as a very good player, isn't he? And, and um, I think you, know, you look at that and you and you think that that Gomez is going to sit behind those, particularly those Possibly. three. Um, mm. So, and if he's not going to fill in at right back because. Because Bradley's going to fill in for for Trent, or if Trent moves further forward, then I mean, bloody hell, Connor Bradley's been exceptional. Um, the the Trent, games that I've got to play is really, really good. Um, yeah, Trent, so Trent can end up in Madrid job. by all accounts because they're talking well, about, you know, that that's pure profit for Liverpool as well if they want to rebuild that team because they've got FFP restrictions just as much as well, not as much as the next team, but they certainly have them as well. Yeah, Roger saying Branthway, great player, worth sixty five million, I think, in the current market. You know, you're probably gonna have to pay that to get a mark, aren't you? Probably. Um, I mean we've got Gordon Cheaper. We've got Gordon Cheaper. You did, but I think Everton were although they wanted it, they wanted more, they were slightly more desperate for the money at that point because of mm. FFP concerns. I mean, sixty million for, for Branthwaite clears their decks an awful lot. Yeah, that's um, a good show as well. I agree, Dave. Tomorrow would yeah, be great a phenomenal great signing. signing. But again, would will be really exceptional. There's the there's the couple that are um who's the lad that is it Diamant is it Diamande that plays for sport? Yeah, the big lad that plays for sport, um, the monster. Yeah, yeah. Chelsea apparently in, in for him as well, I think. There's a um, there's a few like that, that that you could look at that will be an awful lot less than mm. the likes of um than the likes of Tamori. What about um just as Davey's saying there before we move on to our tune? These links for Maldini as director of football. Pa- I mean, Mal- Paolo. Yeah. Pa- pa- Can you still Paolo play? Mal- yeah. <laughs> well, to be fair, he probably could do a better job than half of our defence, to be fair. But uh, it, it's it's a good thing to mention because I think w- with Paolo Maldini, you know, he, he's done a decent job at Milan, but you're thinking about the presence in the game that Maldini has, the name, you know, in terms of going after players and, and, and trying to bring players to this project. I mean, what a, what a stellar name that is just to, to throw out there, you know, Paolo 
Maldini is our director of football. I think I actually said I, I watched the overlap with uh, Les Ferdinand. I thought he came across really well uh, as a director of football as well. And obviously, he has the tie into the club, does Les. You know, uh, Hugo Viana has been mentioned as well, who's done a good job as a, as a sporting director. But Paolo Maldini's box office, mate. And imagine going after players on the continent and Paolo Maldini's coming to tap you up to come play for the two. I mean, that, that's got to have a bit of appeal about it, doesn't it? It has a slight pull, doesn't it? I mean, he's he's possibly the greatest defender to have lived. I mean, he's he's a sensational player. Um, yeah, I mean that's that's a hell of a coup, really. Um, I mean, the the Milan the Milan issues aside, obviously mm. with Tonali. But does that does somebody like that coming in as well? Does someone like just give give Tonali a little bit of a little bit more support? Um, and allows him to, to flourish a little bit more. Um, but, yeah, I mean, that's, that would be a hell of a coup to, to bring in Paolo Maldini as a, 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 as a director of football. I just think the, the man's class, but he brings gravitas, doesn't he? He, does, he certainly does. And there's also, it would be linked to uh, Chiesa again in, in, in the transfer rumours. And it does make you wonder, someone like Maldini comes in, you know, you know, is that easier to sign a player like Chiesa? You know, so it's, it's very interesting. You know that Possibly. he could be could be using his contacts in in Serie. I know we've, we've had a bad experience with the Tonali deal, but uh, <laughs> some of these comments there. Trevor said he played Maldini at left back over Burn. I'm not sure he gets he gets ahead of Lewis Holt, does he, Trevor? I, th- I, th- I think he, his pace might be an issue at this point to play at left back, and we've we, nice. we've we've watched another player at left back that hasn't got to, you know that much. He's pace. still quicker than Burn. He's still quicker than Burn, mate. But I think centre back can still do. I mean, the bloke read the game better than almost anybody I've ever seen in my life. So, I, you know, he, he was he was an unbelievable player, um, and I could, I would agree he probably still do a really decent job. To be fair, he, he probably could, have you seen Clarence Seedorf? I saw some images of him on on X uh, earlier, and he's, he still looks like he could play. He's, he's an absolutely unbelievable shape. And I think he even said, just because I'm not. Training doesn't mean I skip training. You're just like, fuck it, what a machine. Uh, Jay, Jay Toon is saying, very excited about Paolo, to be honest, uh, with his name alone. Definitely the greatest defender, uh, in his opinion. Uh, he made brilliant forwards look like schoolboys. He was uh, he was the best. I just need Kevin's Kevin's comment for, for he's just put in as well. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> <Jenna>. <laughs> <laughs> That's very true. Give him he a couple of games and climatise, yeah. yeah. He would, he would still play burn over uh, over Maldin. There's no there's no doubt about that. But yeah, there's, there's definitely a lot going on. You know, we have to hopefully get European football at the end of the season. And then, you know, having a director of football like him that can, can make Gigi that pull in the continent would just be absolutely sensational. But we'll move on to the last section of the show, which is the bit where we talk about non-Newcastle United, uh, uh, you know, topics that are going on in the world of football. And as God, there's been plenty to, to go through. So out of tune, we, we are going to cover this one. It is kind of out of tune. But it does involve our games. So the first one to talk about is is Calvin Phillips. I mean, you know, we've already talked about it. Calvin Phillips, the Yorkshire Pudding, or the Yorkshire Pudding, as the West Ham fans have been have been calling them, <laughs> um, is obviously having a torrid time on loan. And, and he went to get on the coach um, leaving St James's Park after his team obviously lost, being three one up. And a lot of West Ham fans were waiting for him. And, and I must caveat this by saying, you know, they probably spent a lot of money to travel. Um, you know, the 3-1 up, they thought they were going to win, they lose 4-3, they're very emotional, very annoyed. So they called him useless, and rather than walking away, Calvin Phillips decided to flip him the bird as he got on, on, on onto the bus. And it, it's not great scenes to see um, from both sides, really. You know, I do sympathise with the fans. It's their God-given right to, to call a player shite if they think he was shite. Uh, the player probably should do better and walk away, but but just it just shows to show you where Calvin Phillips' heads at at the minute mark. And just before you, you you give me your take on this, you know everyone lords at Pep Guardiola for being the best manager in the world, right? And he, and he deserves that praise, not that bad, right? But Pep Guardiola, Manchester City, have fucked this kid's career because they've let him rot. You know he, he he's not played any under twenty three football really. He's not been allowed to go out on loan anywhere. That they want a ridiculous fee to sell him. And Pep Guardiola even apologised for not playing him. And this kid has gone from being an England national, playing in a double pivot with Declan Rice, who's now starring for Arsenal, to, to this guy who kind of catch a cold and he's getting done by, albeit superb hip swivels by Harvey Barnes. You know, 
I mean, you got to feel a little bit sorry for Phillips, mate. I mean, but but for, for that reaction, do you think he's overreacted then? He should have just left it. It's an awful reaction for him. Um, yes, Kevin, you did hear a bark. The, the dogs just decided to go nuts in the back. Me, Kevin. Um, it's me so, barking. <laughs> Arrow. Uh, yeah, look, I, I do think Phillips is wasted. I mean, look at some of the performances he has put in for England when he's played alongside Declan Rice. And he, he's still a, he is a very good footballer. He was brilliant um, at, at Leeds under Bielsa. Um I think I think his career has really been shot down, and yeah, you, you're right. I, I think I think Pep. It's one of those ones where you look at it and you think, what was he? What was he really doing? Because why did he want him? He, he was never really going to fit in, because no. he was never going to get ahead of the likes of Rodri and stuff. So unless he thought he was going to be, you know, wait a couple of years and then do it, but he, he's he's not like he was 21 or 22. You know, he, he is getting a little bit, you know, a little bit older and he, he needs game time. And the fact that he hasn't played for two years is really evident um, now that now he is getting game time. He's just not at the level he, he should be. And it, it is quite sad to watch, um, that, to be honest with you, because I, I, do, I do like him as a player. You know, when he's on his game, he, he's a very, very good footballer and, it's, it is sad to see. It really is, but I, you can't. Yeah, and footballers have, have got to have a bit, a bit of a thick skin, and 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 I think fans do as well in that regard. So the, it's give and take with that regard, but it's not a great look for him, is it, to to be doing that to, to fans from his bus? No, I mean, uh, I, mean I think Moyes has come out and kind of said, you know, he's 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 struggling. We need to kind of you know wrap work. Wrap our kind of arms around him and, and everything else. It was not me waiting to abuse Calvin Phillips. No, no, I, I was comfortably nowhere near the ground. I just come on here and rant about people. I don't, I don't wait for the buses. I just I, the buses wait for me. That's what it is. Um, but yeah, I, I do feel sorry for him. And I, I think he's, he's. It's a lesson learned, I think, to a lot of players out there who who are at clubs like Leeds, you know, and Brighton and all these other clubs. Don't always be. Taken with the, with the, the glitz and the glamour of these these massive clubs that want you because things like that can happen, you know. And, and Calvin Phillips probably regrets going to Manchester City now, regardless of you know medals that he's got and stuff like that. He's he's you know he's really set his career back a bit, and, and I think almost almost like uh, almost Jane Sancho style in a way, maybe needs to leave and go abroad somewhere. Uh, you know, get out of the limelight and just, just you know, you know, look, look at Loftus his cheeks got to Milan. He's got ten goals this season, you know, and he's playing really well. And sometimes these players have to leave. Um, you know, the, the, these shows to get away from all that scrutiny. But yeah, I mean, it must be said, Newcastle United have really dodged a bullet, um, you know, not signing Phillips because he would nowhere near have got up to this level that we need him to play at. And he probably would have, you know, he would have had the same issues here. So we've got as West Ham fan, we've got Fly Fox Pro, we've got to see in the comments. As a West Ham fan, I don't want to see him in a West Ham shirt again. He's been nothing but awful. And instead of stepping up, putting in tackles and hustling, he's turned into a turtle. Um which you know it's hard to disagree with as a West Ham fan. You pay your money to see to see that player. Um, you know you were excited probably when, when you signed him, Fox. You know and, and he yeah he hasn't delivered. You know and I think but again going back to him, he probably should have pushed for a move sooner. I think you know Newcastle were after him the season before Mark weren't there, and Pep wouldn't let him go or they wanted more money for him or something like that. So I think City have really done the lad a real um, a real disservice. I think in terms of a player, um, yeah. You know over the last few years. I think go. I would go back to the transfer window, and and there was the the, the continued rumours in Newcastle wanting to, to bring him in. And I said then, I said, look, if you bring him in, you're going to have to wait two months before he's even ready to to play. I, I genuinely think he, he needed to get to somewhere and have two months of solid training, sort of playing for the, you know, playing for the probably the the twenty threes or whatever to to get him back to to match sharpness, um, and. It was going to take too long, especially with with Newcastle's injury problems. He was going to take too long to get to get into any sort of match fitness, and yeah. he's been sort of thrown into this by by David Moyes. And I think that, I think it's wrong, um, it, it, but he's he, he just needs he needs time, and he he, he just he does, while you're on loan, you don't have that luxury. Um, and he, he, he obviously. West Ham fans are just not happy with him, and you kind of you can completely appreciate why. But I do feel sorry for the lad because he's been properly thrown in it, um, and he's been he's wasted away at City. 
Yeah, you do. Well, there's another former West Ham player that I don't think West Ham fans will feel sorry for whatsoever, and that's the king of the shit houses that is Jesse Lingard. So Jesse Lingard went over to play in Korea, and uh, it doesn't look like it's going particularly well for him, really, Mark, is it? Because the, the FC Seoul manager uh, said this about uh, the, the dancing queen himself. He said, I've been thinking a lot about removing Jesse Lingard. That's obviously from the team. He's not got a rifle or anything like that, so calm down, everybody. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't think the player who doesn't run for a few minutes as a football player, if he doesn't fight and doesn't run better than the player who runs for 90 minutes, if you're going to play soccer in the name, shouldn't you just take the retired players? So Jesse Lingard went over there with this furore that he was going to take, you know, Korean football by storm, Mark, and he's just been pretty crap, hasn't he, in all fairness, which shouldn't surprise any of us. No, not at all. I don't it, it. There are moments of Jesse Lingard's career and you, you sit back and you go, there's, there's there's an absolute player in there. Part of that was at, was at West Ham. I thought he was excellent when he was there. Um, it, but he's just another one of those players that's full of his, his own hype. Yeah, exactly. Um, he, he believes his own hype. He's not willing to put in the hard yards. And, and I think the evidence of, of that was shown. I, th- I think he thought he would, would get a gig in in Saudi, he'd go and earn himself a few million by doing not an awful lot. Um, they laughed at him and told him where to go. Um, and considering some of the money they've been thrown around, I, I guess it was a little bit surprising. But to be honest with you, look at it, look at his last few years, he's been he's been absolutely dreadful. Um, and it, it's really no surprise to have seen him gone and or go and be at the you know, try and be the showboat, not do an awful lot. You know, just act like Billy Big Bollocks and, and not want to not want to graft. And I'm sorry, but give me eleven grafters over somebody like that any day of the week. Well, absolutely. Well, I tell you, one player who does graft, and he used to be on the Cassie United's books, didn't quite work out for him. But credit to him, he moved north of the border, and my God, has he made a career for himself? And that's this fella, James Tavinia. He is now officially the highest scoring defender in British football with 131 goals. That's more goals than Shola Army Obi, that. Um, he, he scored in uh, Rangers 3-1 victory against Hibs, which also had a hilarious moment, which was reminiscent of Bernard and Robert, where one of the Hibs players smashed a free kick right into his mate's face from about two yards, and he knocked him out. But, yeah, Tavinia has been sensational for Rangers, Mark, hasn't he? Penalties, free kicks. I mean, God, the kid gets nearly 20 goals a season, man. Fair play, though. He's, yeah, I, I... I get there's an argument about the league that he's playing in. I completely Arguably. understand that. But look at look at his assist record as well. He has a hundred two hundred and seventy goal contributions. That's in phenomenal five. for a fullback man. That's in phenomenal. under six hundred games as a defender, it's phenomenal. Yes, I can, I can, again, <laughs> it is only Scotland. You can only play what's in front of you. But as a defender, to have 270 goal contributions is unbelievable. Um, so, you know, fair play to the lad because he's, he's, he's had a st- stellar career up there. Absolutely. He's, he's been he's absolutely brilliant for them. Yeah, fantastic. What, what a name that is. We've got Skidmark and Steve Bruce's wife friends. Hello. Hello to you, mate. What a great, what a great name. Yeah, a, a scary image, but a great name. Darren saying <laughs> thanks, chaps. Great show tonight. If you're leaving us, Cheers, Darren, man. thanks for thanks for tuning in. Uh, catch the rest on, on, on the catch up. We've got that much to cover tonight. We might overrun a little bit, but uh, but yeah, I mean to be fair, Scottish football, you know, you know my dad's a Celtic fan. There's been some unbelievable players come out of that league. You know, you're talking about you know Virgil van Dijk, Henrik Larson, um you know, um, Gattuso, um, you know, Laudrup, you know, Gaza played there. There's, there's been some really good footballers in that division, you know, so th- there has been some, not even even old Lego head himself, Arteta played up there, didn't he? So, you know, so there has been some good footballers that have come out of that division, but yeah, fair play to Vigna. I don't think he would have had the legendary status, you know, anywhere else. If you come to the Premier League, you probably would have been an all right, right back, but you would never have got that level of goals. And you, you just, you just know for a <laughs> Sorry, Ian. How could I forget Boom Song? Oh my God! I nearly do it. Said the same as well. Yeah. Thanks, Ian. I'm going to bed angry now. Thanks a lot. And then just for you, (laughs) Kev. Well, you know, Boom Song. He's a very good player. You know, I think he could play at the back. Three at the back. You know, I love three at the back. Uh, But yeah, there was. I mean, there has been some good players there. But yeah, to be fair, to to Vinny, that's an unbelievable record. Unbelievable record. So, but we have got a few other things to cover in our tunes now. 
the, there's been loads of football going on over Easter. Um, Manchester United managed to, to, to fuck up once again, which is excellent for us because uh, we're trying to catch them bastards. But they drew one each with uh, Brentford. I mean, to be fair, they should have got beat about 3 4 1, really, the amount of shots that Brentford had. Um, but they drew ones each. And it must be said, the king of the shithouses himself, Neil Mope, um, <laughs> tweeted this after the game. So this was, I think it was Scott, Mc, is it Scott McTominay? Yeah. Trying to, uh, yeah, trying to grab his shirt. And he said, this fan was desperate. For my shirt, Brentford then went one better and said, "Everybody wants the shirt. They're available in the club shop." After this, which I just thought was was fucking sensational. You may not be everybody's cup of tea, old Neil Mopai, but that was that was beautiful shit house without me. That was incredible. Yeah, he's absolutely king of king of the shit houses. Look, he's not a he's not a pleasant individual, um, but he's a little bastard. There's an awful lot of that that right. Look, I, I oh, Christ, when when I was it just be it was just before Man U scored. And I text you and I went, you just let it fucking go go win this one nil with like one shot, one goal. They went and fucking scored. I was like, Oh, you've got to be kidding me. Um <laughs> but thank God for Christopher Ayer for, for scoring the um scoring the equalizer. Some, some assist by Tony as well, the touch and oh, the it, movement. Oh fucking hell, that was brilliant, man. Was yeah, it was incredible. Kind of, I mean, they missed so many chances. I mean, they hit the they hit the woodwork um a couple of times, but they they should have been three or four up and and completely out of sight. And it was just like Man U to to nearly go on and win that game. It would have been an absolute travesty, but thank thankfully they they only they only got a point in the end. Absolutely. Well, there was another team that the balls up as well and and couldn't beat another team beginning with B, and that was Chelsea. They couldn't beat Burnley. Yeah, they drew twos each, but that wasn't the the main talking point again. The, the main talking point well, that was. Funny. was well, that was funny. Was Conor Gallagher completely blank in this poor mascot, looking looking for a oh, high yeah. five or a, or a or a handshake or something? And Conor Gallagher is I don't know where he is. He's thinking about hairspray or something like that. He's all over the place, uh, and he just blanked this poor little kid. And then weirdly, almost like somebody hijacked his social media feed, and he had a picture of this. And the Bernie captain was looking forward, and there was a caption saying, "There's no room for racism." You were like, "You're, you're blanking the kid, Gallagher." <laughs> What are you talking about, me? So I don't know what was going on there. So, no, I, I, I mean, I don't think it's anything like that, but it, it's just, no. it just looks awful. I mean, he looks at the kid. He, if you watch Poor the footage, fact, he, t- he looks at the kid as the kid's got his hand up ready to high five me. And you're like, what are you doing? Just give the kid a, sh- a handshake. For God's sake, man. Exactly. Come on. Exactly. Shocking. I'll tell you somebody else who's not going to be shaking hands, though. This isn't the first time that Roy Keane has gone in hard on Haaland. And I'm not talking about his dad. I'm talking about, uh, you know, Erling Haaland, the superstar striker himself. Now, Manchester City and Arsenal played in the big game of the Easter weekend, which was destined to be a shit nil-nil, as, as, as it always is when, when sky-hype games look like that. But Roy Keane said this about Erling Haaland. In front of goal, he's the best in the world, but his general play for such a player, is so poor. And he actually said he, he's like a League Two footballer, is what he called him. And it's quite funny because when you look at uh, Isaac, as we were talking about before, Isaac's ability on the ball, um, I think Roy Keane has a bit of a point, really, because Haaland's touch at times is fucking dreadful, isn't it? He's he's an awful footballer. He's a sensational centre-forward. There isn't a better, better centre-forward on the planet, really. I mean, he's a little bit out of form at the moment, but... He's absolutely unbelievable. But as an overall footballer, he's shocking. His awareness of what goes on in the field, other than in the box, is, is absolutely dreadful. He, 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 his passing's dreadful. Um, his touch at time is, sh- is shocking. Um, but put him in the box and he's he, there's nobody better than him. He, he's, he's phenomenal. But he, I think Keane's bang on the money. He's, he's genuinely absolutely dreadful footballer. Um but like I say, just uh, you can be the best in the world at one thing. But he, look, he he does that awfully well. But and I sometimes think when you when you look at the way that City play, he just doesn't suit City. No, no, because he, he's not good enough on the ball. If Harry Kane had went there, we'll get onto Harry in a second. But if Harry Kane had gone there, because he's got that ability as a footballer, I think Harry Kane probably would have fit in a bit better. In all fairness, Ian said as much as he can't stand Roy Keane, he is hilarious. He is really funny. But as Ty says, he does regularly <laughs> wipe his ass. He really does. There's no doubt about that. Luke's telling us to clip something. I don't know what we're clipping there, but uh, Mark, Mark's the clip man. So uh, which, which bit do you mean, Luke? <laughs> Drop that in the comments and I'll have a look at it. Yeah, there's lo- there's loads to clip. There's loads to clip. But talking about poor Harry Kane. Actually, no, before we go, Kane. So at the end of the, the City game, 
there was there was a bit of a scene, wasn't there, with Pep Guardiola? It sounds like I'm going to be slagging Pep Guardiola off again. We'll get City fans in the comments going mad here. But I do like Pep. But I've got no room for this shit, in all fairness. He come on the pitch and he absolutely berated uh, Jack Grealish. You know, it wasn't because his shorts are too tight. And it wasn't because he's got weird hair. It wasn't anything to do with that. He was just yelling at him for something that went on in the game. And you know, I love Pep's passion and all that, Mark. But... You do this down the tunnel, man. Do this in the dressing room. You don't need to embarrass the lad in front of all the owner cameras and stuff like that. And Grealish looked like he was a bit pissed off by the whole thing. And then he just obviously started nodding along and, and, and everything else as well, you know. And uh, it, it, it's not great, mate, is it? You know, to do that to a player on the pitch like that, it's not good, is it? He's 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 got a bit about him, hasn't he? For that, for that, he's he's done it to others in games. He's done it to Haaland. I think he's done it to Foden. He's done it to others when he when he's come on. He's and, and Grealish has had it a, a couple of times when he's come on the field afterwards and, and really had a had a go at him for stuff. And I, I get it; it's in the heat. You you want to get this out and you want to you want to talk to them straight away. But to to be berating players or or to really be go, doing that, it's just. It always reminds me a little bit of um oh what was the the whole um manager Brown was it oh Phil um, Brown when he did the Phil old, Brown. Uh, when Jimmy did yeah Jimmy when the, the Jimmy the Bullard yeah. celebration it, it, it sort of shades of that almost but um not quite as excessive but it, it's a, it's a funny one you, you you want him to get him down the tunnel and and go to you know like that I, I, doesn't look great. I, I understand kind of why he does it. He want he wants to while it's fresh in the memory, while everybody's sort of thinking about what's just gone on. He wants he wants to get his point across and stuff. But at the end of the game, you you, you shake hands, you you walk away, and you, you get down the tunnel, and then you debrief. Yeah. Um, there's plenty of time That's to have done all that away from the away from the field. Yeah. That, I, I agree with that. Yeah, but Ian said he, he did it to Zlatan, and Zlatan told him to do one. He's quite lucky Zlatan didn't roundhouse kick his head off. To be fair, because <laughs> I don't think he would put up with that much shit, mate. In all fairness, but uh, yeah, I didn't agree. I, I thought it was a little bit overkill, personally. But um, someone else who had a bad weekend as well was uh, was poor Harry Kane. It was it's almost the cameras caught the moment. It's like that Simpsons episode where. Uh, Lisa rejects Ralph Wiggum and Bart rewinds it and says, you can see the part where his heart breaks in two. Poor Harry <laughs> Kane kind of got caught in the camera with that moment, didn't he, when uh, you know uh, Bayern Munich were beaten by Dortmund in the, obviously the huge game uh, in the Bundesliga. I think Thomas Tuchel's even uh, um, turned around and and congratulated um, you know, Bayer Leverkusen for winning the league, hasn't he? Um, so it's not looking good for Harry, is it, in terms of getting a, getting a title winner's medal there, mate? Well, we all thought it was we, we all thought it was a shoe in, didn't we? That they were going to go and win the league, and you know Harry would get his silverware and stuff, and it's 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 really backfired, hasn't it? It's um, they've um, I can't help but laugh. Actually, you go from Spurs were perennial that you know the the, the team that that misses out on on things or, or you know gets beat in the final, and you go to buy and you think you know biggest club in the in the country, you're a shoe in to to win the league. You're a shoe in to to probably win a cup and stuff. And you just look and go, yeah, it's the, the one season where they're now. What are they? Thirteen points behind Leverkusen now. Um, it's, it's a bless them. I do feel a little bit for sorry for, but it, it is quite funny. It, it is quite it is quite humorous in, in, in many ways. But hey, I tell you what, I'd take Harry Kane at Newcastle this summer if he wants to swap the Bundesliga for uh, the Premier League and come back and break Shearer's record in a black and white shirt. I'll have you back, mate. No doubt about that. But it was quite funny actually talking about Leverkusen and, and the coolest man in football, that's Javi Alonso. So he's had a lot of um, uh, jip from pundits, none so more than old hairy hands himself, Richard <sighs> Keyes, who, who questioned whether he has the, the cojones to be the Liverpool manager. And he said, jobs like Liverpool don't come along very often, Real Madrid. And he mentioned Bayern Munich actually in the sentence where he was having a go at Javi Lonzo for staying in Germany. You were like, you've just mentioned a German team that he might go to, you fucking moron. You know, maybe put down the jam donuts, Richard, because they're, they're making your brain go a bit crazy, mate. But, but also, what I found a little bit disrespectful about that comment as well, there are two managers incumbent in those jobs. Exactly. And so are you still at... Still Real Madrid and Tuchel, yeah, although we'll be another, leaving. For another the, year as well. We sort of almost know that Tuchel will be leaving in the summer, but he's still in the job. Mm. So it, it's a little bit disrespectful in that point to, to start saying that, yes, the Liverpool job's available. 
he doesn't want to go there. He he wants to continue to to learn where he is. Why why is that such a problem for everybody? He's a really young manager. He's young in his in his development. He's 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 got Leverkusen playing sensationally well. They've got a brilliant squad, and and yeah, well, I completely agree with you. How, give him some credit for wanting to stay and build on what he's accomplished there. And that if they can go on and do do big things, if they can can hold on to some of their players as well, I think they'll they'll stand more chance of that. And the fact that they they would be league. League, you know, league champions. So, give him some credit. No, it, it, it doesn't. He doesn't lack balls for 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 not wanting to move on. I give him all the credit in the world for it. Well, exactly. Some of his comments about old hairy hands, like Stu say, he can only still be employed for shits and giggles. He spout utter bile repeatedly. And Ian said he even said apparently Wilson was better than Isaac. My God, he he definitely is uh, eating way too much sugar in that buffet, clearly because he's putting about nine stone since he's gone over to work for BN Sports. You BN fat, Richard, is what you are, mate. Fucking idiot. Uh, so, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll not pay much attention to that fucking moron, to be fair. But, but on Javi Alonso, just one last point on that, Mark. Um, if he wins a Bundesliga and he stays at Leverkusen to try and retain that title... You know, Ancelotti's got one more year at Real Madrid. And I think what these Liverpool fans aren't remembering, and, and you know, again, with Keys, it's just th- this pure arrogance that the Premier League is the best league in the world of all time. Yeah. Javi Alonso played, you know, God, how many times? You can look it up quickly for me there. He played so many times for Real Madrid and so many times for Bayern Munich. He's got an affinity to both of those clubs as well as Liverpool. You know, arguably he might have played even more games for Real Madrid than he probably did for Liverpool. You know, so... And he's and he's a Spanish international, you know. So so surely the Madrid job will appeal to him probably more than than the Liverpool job in many ways. And also, I think what he's doing is why on earth would he want to be the guy that follows Klopp? Wouldn't you want to be the guy after the guy that follows Klopp? What happens if the guy who follows Klopp bombs? Look at Manchester United as a prime example and Arsenal when yeah. they both lost Fergie and Wenger. Absolutely There's a real right. risk factor that those jobs could go massively tits up. Why would Alonso want to ruin his? Is 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 young career that's going like that by making a decision like that so early? Yeah, completely, completely agree with that. Look, he he, he played two hundred thirty six games for Real Madrid, two hundred ten for Liverpool. He played another one hundred twenty four for Sociedad and one hundred seventeen for for Bayern Munich. So, is he, he played the the bulk of his career? Obviously, in in La Liga, he played for Ibar as well. Um, but the 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 biggest number of games being at Madrid, so. There's a there's a route in there. If Angelotti's got one more year, there's a route there for him to go in and take over. Um, yeah, that's, that's yeah. Also, Luke says he's coming. Over. That's what he's waiting for. Look, he's just waiting for Eddie to take the England job, and he's going to come in there be the Newcastle manager. I hope he brings his boots. My God, him in midfield would be sensational. <laughs> he really, really would. But uh, I think that's us all pretty much done, Mark. We've overran slightly because we've had so much stuff to go through tonight in the hour of tune as well, guys. So thank you so much for everybody for jumping in the comments. It really helps the episode flow. We always enjoy this Monday show, especially hour of tune because it's a good bit of fun as well. So thank you so much to everybody who's uh, smashed a comment in. If you haven't already, subscribe. We'd love you to come and join us. We're edging very close to the 7,000 mark, so loads of room for you guys in the Evermore community. It's all good banter, as a few of the lads have said in the chat tonight. West Ham fans in there. All fans are welcome in our chat. You know, just no abuse, just football chat. My new slogan is, if you act like a prick, you're getting a flick. That's what I'm going to say from now on. You know, if, if anyone starts giving a shit, you're out the door. We did it to a few knackers last week. We ain't scared to do it again. But this channel is all about football chat and a bit of banter as well on a Monday night. So I hope you've enjoyed your bank holiday Monday with us, guys. We'll be back soon. Mark will be on post-match duties. I'm putting the wrong way. He'll be on post-match duties tomorrow because I am away at the day job. So make sure you tune in and give him some love. And until then, have a great evening, everyone. We'll catch you on the next one. See you guys. Take care.